Hi, my name's Dylan Holmes, and you're watching On the Mission Trail. You're watching On the Mission Trail, a student-produced news magazine on McKay TV. And now, On the Mission Trail with your host, Dylan Holmes. Today, we're going to Al Sal High, talking with a local group of artists, and checking out the Youth Arts Collective. Recently, we took our cameras out to Al Sal High School to find out what it takes to be on the cheer team. I currently have 86 girls. I had 220 girls try out uh, for the cheer team. I had 110 that made the squads. So I have three squads, freshmen, JV, and varsity. We practice Monday through Thursday from 4.15 to 6.15. The girls get out of school at 3 o'clock and they're required to go to tutorial from 3 to 4. And they're required, it's not uh, if they want to. It's, it's one of our mandatory things they need to do. They come to practice, we stretch, and then they get about an hour and 10 minutes to learn a routine of about a minute and 40 seconds that they will perform halftime during their game. So freshmen will perform during their freshman game, JV during their halftime, and varsity during their halftime. So each squad is learning a new routine every week. On top of learning their performance, they also need to um, keep practicing cheers, learning the crowd pleasers, and the defense and offense cheers that they need to perform during the game. So these girls, when they try out, we also need to fundraise. So we need to, I as an advisor need to organize fundraising because the school doesn't provide uniforms or any of the gear that they need. And so we need to fundraise. So we start in April, May fundraising and then it goes into the summer so we have our conditioning all of June and then in July we fundraise harder to make because that's the month that they need we need to order everything and so we keep fundraising and then we practice really hard for Jamboree because Jamboree we have halftime performance when our team plays and for Jamboree all three squads perform together. We currently don't have a GoFundMe, but they could contact Mr. Jose Gill through our Alice Athletics. Anybody that would like to make a donation to Alice Cheer, and it'll go straight to our account to help us out. Mr. Gill has banners around the school giving recognition to those companies that offer donations to certain sports, to any athletics. It costs anywhere between $1,200 and $2,000 that the girls need to either pay themselves or fundraise. And I have like three-fourths of the girls fundraise and others just choose to pay out of pocket. Yeah, and it's exciting. What I try to do, I try to change it up so that the girls can wear the same uniform for two years so that it wouldn't be so expensive. We just change the liners up depending on the squad. The freshmen wear black and the JV wear green and varsity wears white. And so according to the level of color that you have, the girls know what squad they're in. So the goal is to get to white. The process of coming up with a routine is the music has to be no bad words. And so we try to not have any words at all, just music. And then according to the music, the girls, my captains mainly, come up with a routine. So it could be from 28 counts to 38 counts that the girls need to learn by Friday. It's a lot of work, but a lot of these girls, it's in their blood. A lot of them have been doing it since they were like seven, eight years old. So they're very dedicated. And that's one of the things that we promote is dedication. Without it, it's not gonna work. Well, I graduated from Alisa High myself. I'm an alumni. And when I was here, I was a song leader. So different times, different requirements, but I've had my nieces and my daughter is currently a cheerleader. She's a JV. No, 
the school does provide transportation for us when we go to away games. So they provide us a bus to the game and then back home. So whenever the girls need to leave early, I have to fill out an early release form and the activities director approves it and sends it out to the teachers. So our uh, we we work hard, but our, our priority above anything is um, their education. So um, right now we're doing grade checks. So like I said, they're required to go to tutorial from three to four, and then they come here to practice. So I check tutorials to make sure that they're attending their tutorials. And that is to help them maintain their grades. So the girls need to maintain a 2.0, but in cheer we require them to maintain a 3.0. We push for it. And so um, last year I had a lot of um, girls get awarded because they had a 3.0 or higher. So I was very proud of that. To me, being a cheerleader, it means um, being school spirited, being positive, um, spreading positivity, and um, being a leader. For me, being a cheerleader is almost everything in the world to me. I've been doing it for such a long time that it just comes natural when I come out onto the field. I just know I'm ready to do things, what I need to be done, and just spread positivity, encouragement, and love to all my teammates and everybody else. Um, being a cheerleader, um, for me, it's being a role model for the for any girls and just people in general because there's a lot of this, like there's a stigma around being a cheerleader that you're just what is seen, seen on movies, but sometimes that's not the reality and well, most of the, honestly, the reality, it's not like that. Um, uh, that stigma is, I don't think that we have it here at ASA. Um, all the girls are very nice and we strive to be leaders in our community, not in our community and at school. So I think that's what means for me to be a cheerleader. To me, being a cheerleader is being respectful and responsible because little girls like will be on the stand and they'll be like, oh, I want to be a cheerleader and you just have to be their role model. And there's nothing like the feeling of going out onto the field and performing, it's just amazing. So for me, it can be challenging to find time for it since um, I have my classes and I'm also involved in two other clubs. But um, I think it's, it's worth it seeing um, my routine being performed. Making a dance is very time consuming but we all work together and collaborate and we all throw in our ideas and in the end, seeing it out on that field is really inspiring to keep wanting to make new dances each and every other week. So this week we were presented with an obstacle and only a few of us were able to perform. So we had to come up with a dance on the spot and I just wanna thank our captains because they do put in a lot of time and effort into this. I'd just like to um, advise like people watching out there, especially ones um, that are in high school, to if you want to try something out, since I know for me um, when I was going to be a cheer, when I was going to be a freshman, cheer was not my first option, but I tried it out and I really liked it. So if you want to try something new, go for it. For me, like um, trying new things, like I, th I think for a lot of people, like when you think of cheer, it's like kind of scary because it's something new, especially in high school. Like you come out as a freshman and you have like all these upperclassmen and trying this new thing, like bringing out to the field, um, really put me out there to like other experiences that like I normally wouldn't have gotten if I hadn't joined in cheer. It just really breaks you out of your shell and it's great meeting new people that are gonna really be there and support you. A group of local artists who are concerned about the effects of pesticides have made a mural. Here's Coral with the details. Hey, it's Coral and we're here at Ijos del Sol and we're going to learn a little bit about the amazing program that this is. So tell me about the history of this program. Um, a little bit of history, Kat. Um, Ijos del Sol uh, began back in 1994 after I uh, fresh out of college. And, uh, I wanted to become a teacher. I, I wanted to instruct differently. So my method was to, to uh, introduce illustration and most of the uh, curriculum standards. And so we created instead a, uh, an after school program back then. And, and um, 
we dedicated it to the illustrator and all of us. So um, we began building the idea of experimental spaces until I came across at, uh, an institution back then that was trying to form a uh, multidisciplinary program. And so I was under the umbrella of Ali South Center for the Fine Arts for probably 15 years. And then we decided to go on our own. Um, six years ago, we became our own company. Uh, we got ourselves a 501c3 with the help of many people. And uh, so what we want to do, we want to create our own space. We want to create a studio space for the studio-less person. Uh, the one that, that draws, paints, and makes a mess, but creates stuff, you know. So uh, the institutes of, uh, of a child that draws and paints, I, I relate to because I grew up that way. So, um, so definitely that's, that's what we want to accomplish. Uh, we do it here uh, thanks to Salina City School District, uh, Mary Pritchard uh, Magnet Program. They allow us to use this space as an experimental space in the meantime until we make our uh, uh, our, or create our, our project or our building until we get, obtain our own building. So <laughs> we're still in that process. However, along the way, we've always uh, been able to collaborate and, and engage with many, many, many students, many, many even adults. So our, our program serves everyone, uh, no matter their uh, human state, no matter their human situation. Mm -hmm. This is for everyone, so uh, we're open three days a week and uh, in the evening from, from 6 to 8. And um, at occasions, we, we do have three um, big events in, in our program. Uh, we have three major exhibits that are, I would say, colleagues uh, or students, whatever you want to call them. It's, they're just the illustrators, just like I am, but uh, we all collaborate to make the exhibits. So the first exhibit is on May, which is for to all mothers. In Spanish called A Toda Madre, which is kind of like a little slang, a little playful, but it's to all mothers, you know, mm -hmm. even, even the ones you don't consider to be great mothers, but mm -hmm. to the mother, <laughs> uh, to the two mothers, to the two fathers, to mm -hmm. uh, all, Everyone. all, everything's inclusive. So, mm -hmm. so we wanted them to create things that create life. Mm -hmm. And then we have, during the summer, we have one that's called Caravatos, which is um, it's just an, an approach to uh, scribbles. Just scribble and, and do your art, whatever it looks like. It doesn't have to mean anything, so just have fun. And, uh, and our one for the winter, which is coming up, I hope you guys can come, is for the other Dias de Muertos, uh, Days for the Deceased. Um, that's coming up in October, November. So I hope you come. Um, we're doing a CCUMB Center for Fine Arts and Culture with Enid Rice and many, many other people. And it's all about knowing that we're all equally involved in that process. Right. We live, I mean, we are born, we live, and we cease. So those are the three uh, exhibits that we do every year. And we get a lot of people involved, and specifically people who are passionate about what they do. That's incredible that you're able to bring the universal language and connect people with it. Oh yeah, thank you, thank you. Even even communications. But this is great what you're doing. So mm -hmm. I believe that even people who don't know about us through this kind of you know, um, situation, they might be able to to, uh, to know about us. So yeah. thank you. So tell me a little more about why you find that art is very important to teach the youth and in schools? Yeah, you know, il il illustration has a, a way to, uh, to, uh, to define ideas, you know. So it's, it's writing and illustration. I believe illustration is writing and writing is illustration. Yeah. And, and, I, and I'm a firm believer that, that letters are illustrations and, and we illustrate letters. And even if you do an illustrated paragraph, you know, uh, so I, I feel like it, it's an important way to understand what we have in our minds. Not, not just writing a paragraph of something, but when you read, you're already imagining mm -hmm. what you're reading. And so you connect it. So, so illustration becomes a very vital part. Now, many children who, who, are, uh, who learn differently, well, it's very diverse, the, the learning process. So in some children learn different than others, and I believe that we have a different kind of path that leads to the same thing. Yeah. And 
you know, we, we have such a, we live in such a diverse world and diverse, uh, I don't know, animal life and, and plants. So, so I figured that uh, as humans, we are diverse ourselves. And however importantly that we're typically the same, more important, but different and the less. And, and we have a different way of learning. Like the horse does not learn the same, does not have the same ability as, as a squirrel per se. No. But they have a task, and they're important to life, to the life cycle. Yeah. So with us, it's, it's the same way. So you learn differently. But illustration, painting uh, can lead to, uh, to another understanding. It could be that together they can shape the world. And I think it has. We all have those elements, uh, everything, that, everything that's built and that's everything that's not naturally born. I think it has those elements. Well, I see so much life in this whole room and oh, thank you. in the murals that you've created and in the plans that you have. So oh, Thank you very much. I don't do it alone. I, I do have my colleagues, my friends, and they're my teachers for the most part. And I believe that um, we collaborate most of the time. And things that are bigger than our lives, you know, I don't paint much on a canvas. It's very rare that I paint on a canvas, which I'm hoping to do soon. But. <laughs> But when it comes to uh, painting murals, it's never me alone. It's, it's all, always this collaboration of ideas, minds, feelings, emotions, yeah. peoples, programs, even finances, you know, so. I usually tell people, if I, I can't paint if I don't have a brush, but the brush was created by someone. So, you know, it's always a collaboration. Mm -hmm. We don't think we're alone. And it's incredible because, you know, we all might have those diverse ways of thinking and doing yeah. everything, but then we come together and collaborate with art. Yes. With these beautiful yes. murals. One of the most amazing people that I've met along the way, trying to learn who I am, mm -hmm. is Michelangelo, Leonardo. Leonardo da Vinci, yeah. he, he was this magnificent scientist. You yeah. know, so, but he did it through his illustration mm -hmm. and some writing. It's amazing what you can do. I think everything is built that way. It's, a, it's, it's basically common sense. Uh, we live in a world that most everything is done for you. And most everything is fabricated. Right? And you don't see who's doing it, who's making it. And, it's, and we bring those spaces. It's like the, 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 the mother that, that cooks in front of you and, and gets all the elements and gets, gets all the food together to create this feast. So we, we need to do the same thing. You watch as, as the creative process. Yeah, the creative process. Watch it and then see if this is something you want to continue to Wonderful. Well, thank, thank you so you. much for doing everything for our community and bringing oh, everyone together. God, thank you. I, I don't think I do everything but yeah. some stuff, but we'll do it together. Yeah, we'll uh, do it together. There you go. Continue uh -huh. to bring arts back to the schools and back to the whole world. Yes, I, yeah. schools needs it. Thanks. Yeah. So now we're here with Juan to learn a little bit about his history with the program. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about how you got involved. Well, uh, when my mother was uh, pregnant with me and my sister, uh, she was involved with uh, a study known as Chamacos, which was surveying the effects of pesticides or the potential effects of pesticides on the development of uh, children in the Salinas Valley. and. Um, I was one of the children that was to be surveyed uh, through this program and study. And um, as a child, I was um, put through several tests, such as like um, motor function tests and uh, just general like uh, surveying how I compared to other kids that say weren't exposed to as many pesticides as kids in the Salinas Valley. And uh, when I turned 15, uh, a gentleman known as uh, James Nolan from the University of Berkeley offered me a job with a sister study of Chamacos known as Cosecha, which was uh, further surveying the Salinas Valley uh, in specifics, uh, teenage girls that uh, may have gone through some sort of uh, hormone disrupting uh, stage of uh, you know, being affected by pesticides. And uh, I was offered a job as an environmental sample technician where I went out and uh, collected data on uh, the distance between um, pesticides or more like fields being sprayed by pesticides and the participants' homes. Uh, I went and collected dust samples from those homes where I would, those would be sent to um, the University of 
of Berkeley, where they were to be analyzed for different types of pesticides to further uh, explain or prove their thesis correct. Levels of pesticides in the home. Mm -hmm. uh, now we have moved on to create a mural with the Hijos del Sol, del Sol team, uh, the Hijos del Sol team, to uh, sort of highlight the correlation between pesticides and the community, specifically what's good and what's bad, and what families can do to further protect themselves from uh, a great exposure of pesticides that have, has been proven to be harmful in many cases. And um, so basically my position in this study is um, a youth researcher who has gone out and collected data and uh, is now finding a way to translate that data into a visual representation that the whole community can see and learn from. It's beautiful. I, the mural's turning out great. So, and that'll for sure be able to educate people as well. So, are you planning on pursuing science and that same career? Uh, no, but I am uh, hoping to study computer science uh, when I enter college this fall and hopefully use my skills to uh, create tools that can make uh, tasks like this easier, maybe create, maybe create uh, better data collection methods, and uh, just enhance the relationship between um, a human and a computer to make uh, tasks on a computer much easier than they already are now. So no, I will not be pursuing a career in uh, environmental science, but I will you know, just be around the same scientific area, just creating tools that can make jobs like this much easier. Well, well, I'm excited to see where you end up and the wonderful things you'll do. Mm -hmm. So thank you for speaking with us today. Thank you. Now we're here with Carmen to learn a little bit more about the documentary that's being created. So how far have you guys gotten on the documentary so far? Well, we're actually still commencing the documentary. Mm -hmm. We did do a time lapse beforehand to do kind of like the first unveiling, kind of hyping people up to get the word out about the mural. But mm -hmm. now we're working on a more in-depth documentary where we're going through and explaining specific pieces of the mural and also how it created and what's the, the message about the mural for the public. All right, so tell me a little bit about the message. Well, Pretty much the message that we want to convey here is not the negativity that surrounds pesticide exposure, but kind of the positive side, the, the family aspect of it, of how we want people to stay protected. For example, if like you look at the mural, you'll see pieces where we have like the mother and the daughter washing their hands together, or people who leave their boots out before going inside. It's more like showing the precautions that need to be taken to protect the community in general, given Salinas is a big population that's majorly made up of field workers mm -hmm. and that's our main focus to make field workers feel represented that they're cared for and we want them to prosper. Well that's incredible. So how has it been working along at Ijos del Sol on this project? Well it's been really cool because I mean I've always really liked drawing and stuff. Um, I've just never worked on something like such a big scale Right. and I think it's pretty cool because you know so many studies go on not just here but like around the world so many scientific studies go on and not a lot of people get to see like the research papers or the really long essays and I think the mural approach is a lot more creative. It's, yeah. it's a lot more fun to look at. It's not like, it's not exclusive to a certain gender or language or an age group. It's pretty much anyone can understand art. It's like the universal language. Yeah, that's so, that's so true. So anyone can look at this and yeah, learn from it and was, know about the whole study that you've done. Yeah, that that's was That's incredible. Goal. Why don't they do every study like that, you know? Um, I don't know, but... I guess it's just down to creativity, given we're just a bunch of teams getting together to paint a mural. Well, that's how you get things done. Yeah. <laughs> now we're here with Josue, and we're going to learn a little bit more about the mural that he's creating. So, how long have you personally been part of this program? Uh, since I was 11, so I'm wow. now 21, so <laughs> that's like 10. It's incredible. So what, what's drawn you to it? What's made you stay here? Oh, my connection. Uh, just, well, I started as a student. Mm -hmm. I came from a program Jose I was doing. And I just liked it because I liked how to draw and how to paint. So that's, the, that's how I got into it because I like how, how the pencil is removed like, and the paper and stuff. Like cut of too. So tell me a little bit about your history with art. How long have you been painting? 
Uh, I've been, been in the area of uh, drawing since I was eight. Wow. So I was eight. And then started start painting when I was 14, I think. When I introduced myself, I introduced me the paint or the brushes. I didn't even know that existed. I just, I knew there were paintings, but I didn't know the process of it. And so, now, now you get to practice it with this yeah, beautiful mural. I, so tell me a little bit about the mural. The mural is uh, supposed to be about pesticides, how that affects the um, the people that are surrounded by the, the fields and stuff. It's uh, for my part, it's just uh, my just uh, the process of mural, which is uh, the painting. The greeting, the cooking, the ideas a student of Chamaco's head, and because they brought all the ideas from from what they were researching. So all we had to do is just put them in into an image for people to understand, and that's that's it for me. I just start painting. <laughs> well, it's a magical mural. I can already tell that it's going to bring a lot of people together while educating them as well. So. Yeah. So now we're here with James to learn a little bit more about the study going on at Berkeley. So tell us a little bit about your history with the program and the study that's going on. Absolutely, yeah. So for the last three years, I've been working with Chamacos in a sub-study called Cosecha, which is really all about um, collecting environmental health data, specifically from teens who are going through rapid developments in their body to see if there's any environmental contaminants or environmental exposures that might be affecting the health in the long term. So we're looking for small dose, long term exposures that might affect, you know, trajectories of development over, you know, five years, 10 years, 15 years. Um, and I've had the great honor to work with a lot of high school youth in the San Jose area over these last three years, train them in environmental health methodologies, uh, environmental health literacy, and then getting to do awesome projects like this. Um, so really what I wanted to do is just, you know, express that gratitude, you know, um, Chamacos has been going on for 20 years now and is regarded as one of the most impactful studies of its type, um, but really its successes are proportionate to involvement and support from the community and uh, it's a great privilege to get to work with groups like uh, Hios del Sol, get to work with local high school students, um, really figure out like what perspectives are, um, you know, not being heard in typical science studies, how can we incorporate those um, perspectives actively in the work that we do into what you know, the next project or the next um, you know, intervention, as it were, is what we call it when we do a project that is geared towards reducing exposures in people's homes or in their environments. Um, and you know, none of this could be possible in the case of Tramacos without you know, the leadership of Dr. Brenda Eskenazi and in the case of Cosecha without the leadership of Dr. Kim Harley. Uh, you know, really just want to give a shout out to our funders as well, uh, the California Breast Cancer Research Program, um, and uh, Jennifer and Brian Maxwell endowed chair at UC Berkeley. Dr. Eskenazi had wanted to do this for a long time, but really the whole point of Cosecha, the whole point of youth engagement in the local uh, context is to figure out what youth want, what local folks want, what they think would be most effective, most impactful, most holistic. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, thank you. So we're here with Meg Biddle, and we're just going to ask her a little bit about what's going on today at Youth Arts Collective. So tell us a little bit about why all the community has gathered here to look at art. Because uh, a lot of them are parents. <laughs> and also the community that collects the work and supports us. This is our annual um, summer art show that follows our 24-hour art-a-thon, which is a crazy way to raise money, but we do art for 24 hours with these kids, and that was last month. And then they take what they've done during that time, and they either continue it on or finish it up. And what you see on the walls is a very prolific amount of art of 60 artists and their mentors. Any uh, further information, uh, go to yacstudios.org uh, and it will, you could follow a blog which gives you some great stories about the kids themselves and about how they've gone on to become uh, really amazing people and uh, experts in their field. It's really pretty cool. Thank you for having us today. Thanks for joining us. Catch us next time on the Mission Trail. The preceding program was made possible in part by the Nancy Eccles and Homer Hayward Family Foundation, the Digital Media Foundation, Yellow Brick Road, and the Arts Council for Monterey County. A big thank you from McKay TV.